All right, so we're gonna get started again this week too. Okay, so it's a real pleasure to welcome you all to today's National Grand Rounds on the impact of placing profits over people. I'm Dr. Mary Carol Jennings, uh, the Vice President of Membership for the National Physicians Alliance, also an alumnus of AMSA leadership and a preventive medicine physician in Baltimore. I'll be your session moderator. Today's topic deals with the role that uh, competitive market forces play in shaping the behavior of, of both those who provide and those who consume medical care. So uh, let me start with thanking Hari Ayar, the AMSA National Grassroots Leader, for hosting us. Uh, Hari will serve as our social media moderator and also close our session. Today's National Grand Rounds is streaming live from uh, the American Medical Student Association Training Ground Conference, hosted by the Feinberg School of Medicine in Chicago. And it's presented by the Partnership to Advance Conflict-Free Medical Education. Uh, this, this partnership is a joint project of the National Physicians Alliance, the American Medical Student Association, Community Catalyst, and also the Pew Charitable Trusts. The project is designed to create both external and internal pressure for medical schools and also academic medical centers to adopt and enforce strong conflict of interest policies. This partnership and related materials are made possible by a grant from the State Attorney General Consumer and Prescriber Education Grant Program, which is funded by a multi-state settlement uh, of consumer fraud claims regarding the marketing of pres prescription drug Neurontin. Our speaker today is Dr. John Santa, and John is trained as a primary care physician in his practice for over 20 years throughout his career. Most recently, he directed the Help Rating Center at Consumer Reports, and uh, has recently transitioned to the post of medical director for that organization. He also sits on the board of the National Physicians Alliance as our national treasurer, and has a, a rich history as a leader and an advocate in, uh, in working to interpret market forces for the, for the public. For the social media savvy in our audience, submit questions to Hari using Twitter handle at NPA Live or hashtag AMSA TG14. Now I'll hand this over to Dr. Santa and Hari and I will be here to moderate uh, questions for 10 minutes at the end and uh, also conclude after, national, after today's national grand rounds. Well, it's my privilege to be here. And uh, those of you who are in the auditorium know that um, my comments um, follow a morning of discussion um, about the healthcare system and about the opportunities uh, that are, are before us. I'm especially thrilled to be able to make these comments um, and to this group because I think, I hope, um, that this is a group that's highly likely um, to have eventual physicians in it um, who see their role um, as, as bigger um, than just taking care of patients one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, as you'll hear, that's a wonderful role. It's a wonderful role. But today we need physicians who are willing to take on um, a bigger challenge. Uh, and this is difficult work. Um, I've been fortunate to have a lot of experience in multiple organizations doing it. And I'm going to do my best to try and share um, what I've learned. Um, I'm very interested in, in feedback um, uh, about this because, um, especially now at the end of my career, I'm, I'm in transition out of uh, consumer reports. Um, it's something, you know, I would like to share. Um, with others uh, uh, who are interested but want, want to do it effectively. Well, as I mentioned in the last hour, I think if you want to be a physician who makes a difference, the start is you have to tell people what you're all about. You have to disclose not just financial relationships, which, you know, 
at NPA and at Consumer Reports, we feel strongly <laughs> that physicians should not have financial relationships with industry. Just like I'm able to tell you as an employee of Consumer Reports, I don't have any financial relationships, I would get fired if uh, uh, I did. Uh, you need to be independent of industry. Industry is sellers. And in, in fact, doctors are sellers. So it's a tricky role for you. Because you also have a huge obligation to patients, who ultimately are the buyers. In fact, you're going to see, I'm going to argue, it's crucial. You need to be on their side. Not just as their clinician, but, but as their agent. <laughs> in a very, very difficult market. And this is a very difficult uh, market. So it's important to tell people what your academic bias is, what your intellectual bias is. I mean, I'm a primary care doctor. I've interacted with specialists my whole life. I've managed them, governed them in a variety of ways, but I'm a primary care doctor. I should have mentioned, and my mentor in public health would give me a, uh, uh, a boot, you know, I got an MPH in 2005, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how much of a difference you can make to a community of, of people. But, you know, you, you need to do something to make that kind of difference. And then, you know, just a tip from a leadership point of view. If, if you want to capture a group of people, tell them a little bit about, you know, your cultural background. I mean, in, in this case, I am on the board of the National Physicians Alliance. That's a group that uh, their direction harmonizes with, with mine. Um, they're interested in many of the same issues that we're interested in at Consumer Reports. Um, and, you know, they're progressive thinkers, and, and uh, uh, so am I. I'll give you a good example. Um, I recently gave a talk to some orthopedic surgeons, and actually the talk was about measuring their performance. Uh, and a variety of consumer concerns uh, about orthopedic surgery. I, I knew I was there to kind of be the tough guy. Um, it was on June 6th. And I mentioned to them that, um, you know, a person who had a lot of effect on my life, my mother, uh, was a nurse in World War II. While she wasn't at D-Day, um, she was in Europe soon after. And a lot of the orthopedic surgeons are military guys. Um, you could tell in the audience they softened, you know. We all know that it's impossible for everybody to agree on everything. There's no way any of you would agree with me on, on everything. You know, what you've got to figure out how to do from a leadership point of view is find common ground. And now you're going to learn how to do that as, as a practicing physician. So you have a big advantage. You're going to learn how to do that because good physicians, they know how to find common ground. Now, you know, I want to tell you that, you know, as I near the end of my career, I mean, being a doctor has just been the greatest thing in the world. Um, in my case, it's enabled me to have an incredible number of options. I mean, I'm proud that I've had 13 different jobs. Uh, I love that. I've been able to do all kinds of different things. I mean, I've worked um, for uh, all different sizes of doctor groups, for hospitals, for insurance companies, I ran a state agency, um, I've worked in research environments, I was a professor in a public health program at Portland State University, and I was consumer reports. Haven't succeeded, I think I'm 11 for 13. You know, I unfortunately closed, um, dissolved a group of 150 physicians who made some bad business choices in the 90s. Um, so lots of options. And I think I've gotten good at those because I'm a doctor. Don't ever let anybody tell you that, oh, you know, you doctors are just best seeing patients. Just go see patients. No, we're great leaders. Why? Because we've been in rooms one-on-one -on -one with people talking about the most important things in their lives. We've been in some of the most stressful situations you can imagine. You get good at that. And, and believe me, you know, I think doctors should practice for about 10 years because then you're good at figuring out what's going on with people, assuming you're a good doctor, listening. As you'll hear, you're good at collaborating with patients, but you should be good at, now wait a minute, I'm drawing a line here. <laughs> 
you know, I'm going to have to confront you about some things you're doing. Uh, you have to have both of those skills. So doctors are great leaders. They are fantastic leaders. And there's doctors all over now playing leadership roles in and uh, out of health. You also are going to learn to both follow and lead. You know, any good physician knows in some cases they're calling the shots. In other cases, um, they're doing what they're told to do. You know, you just can't take good care of people, uh, and everybody is, is trying to lead, you know. I, re I remember, uh, you know, the, the first thing to do at a code is, I'm Dr. Santa, I'm in charge here. <laughs> Every, and everybody else, stop telling anybody what to do here. You know, that's the first rule of, of a successful code. You're going to have great job security. You know, I've got two sons. One is mid-30s, one mid-20s. They're not in health. I love them. They love what they're doing, you know, and, and they're in the environment and environmental and, and entertainment industry. Those are tough industries. <laughs> you know, they're, they're never going to make the kind of money I made. They're never going to have the job security. They're never going to have the kind of respect um, from the community that I have. Um, and 90% of that is I happen to be a doctor, you know. Uh, and I think we lose track of that sometimes. Um, you will make much more than a living wage, much more. Again, I know in my sons, man, they are one mistake away from being in big trouble. You know, if their car blows up, um, if I have one uh, son who has some health problems, you know, and he calls me, um, one day, and he's crying because he's at the pharmacy, and um, uh, his uh, doctor has given him a prescription that costs four hundred dollars for a month. No warning, and you know he's crying because he knows he doesn't have enough money to pay his rent. Now you know I do, so we help him. But you know you feel what life is like out there for middle class people. And, you know, you will have this special respect. I mean, you know, we're still medicine men. Still medicine men. And, you know, that works. <laughs> it really works. And, you know, you need to use that for somebody else other than yourself. You need to use that for your patients and for consumers as a whole. And there's a variety of ways to do that. I, you know, I want to make sure, you know, I don't get involved in active roles around single-payer issues. I'm all for single-payers. I'm all for that. That's just not what I do. There's a lot of other ways that you can advocate for people um, than, you know, to change the system from a, a market-based system to um, a single-payer system. I, I just need quicker rewards, so I do different stuff. By the way, I will tell you, you know, um, uh, I think Shannon mentioned that uh, Vermont is headed in the um, single-payer uh, direction, and um, that is terrific. That's terrific. Um, what you may not know is that currently uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has 70% of the insured market in Vermont. And as I talk to my friends in Vermont, it's very clear who the single-payer in Vermont will be. It'll be Blue Cross Blue Shield. So, you know, even single payer is not going to get rid of insurance companies. <laughs> Just their titles are going to change. You know, hopefully the way they do business will change. But this is going to be a long struggle um, uh, to uh, do something about this. Now, you know, you are in a terrible system. This is a system that uh, is underperforming at an incredibly high price. We're paying a fortune. Um, for really poor performance. Multiple countries, including some from kind of underdeveloped countries, are outperforming us. So that's the challenge here, um, both near term and far term. What do we do? Because this is such a mess. Now, part of it is because of the way our country works. I mean, our emphasis in the, in the US is on individual freedoms in the context of a market economy. That, that many of my, you know, I have a, a nephew who's a hedge fund guy in uh, New York, you know, and he will say we have the best economy in the world, and we do. 
You know, if you're in Japan or you're in Greece or you're in Ireland, ooh, you know, things are not looking good. Um, uh, you know, our economy has come back from 2008. You know, it's the best in the world. It's generating value. Just in health, not the kind of value that we need. Don't kid yourself, money counts. It is what's being kept track. I mean, you're in the industry that controls, you know, 17, 18% of all the money in the country. By the way, that's an amount of money that's bigger than many other countries' whole budgets. You know, lots of people are going to tell you, yeah, we have 30% of waste. We're not going to give it up. You know, 30% of waste is somebody's job. 30% of waste is somebody's retirement plan. I mean, I look at my retirement plans and go, Oof. you know, if the healthcare market collapses, 16% of the economy goes in the tank, what's that going to do to my retirement plans? I'm counting on that. You know, well, I don't invest, can't invest in drug companies uh, or even sector mutual funds that only have drug companies in them, I can still see when I look at my mutual funds, Pfizer's all over the place. You know? So, I, I mean, we are in a market-based economy. Money counts. So what's important and what's fair is that buyers and sellers both have the same information. You have to have a level playing field. Now, that's difficult, and to some degree, you know, what we've said is, well, we'll solve that by, we'll have a safety net system that'll kind of take care of the casualties of the market-based system. Well, that's okay, um, but I think it falls short. We'll have philanthropies, you know. Um, you know, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is a wonderful philanthropy, but obviously their founder was um, uh, a person who, you know, led a large pharmaceutical company. Um, uh, and, and, and so, it, again, even our philanthropies in many respects link back to, you know, our market-based um, uh, economies. Markets are messy, okay? Uh, as what Adam Smith said, you know, their beauty is they allocate by the invisible hand. You wake up one morning and a company's bankrupt, okay? They didn't do it. They didn't compete. Their product wasn't good enough. Their, uh, uh, it was too expensive. They're gone. Nobody had to close them down. The government, you know, some regulator didn't close them down. The invisible hand closed them down. And, and now, you know, think about it. An awful lot of us are probably more comfortable rationing using the invisible hand of the market than actually being responsible for those decisions. And, 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 you know, I think one of the challenges, I, I personally would rather have people like you ration my care. But I want you to be free of influence for the buyer. I want you to be accountable. I want you to have the guts to say, um, you know, we decided to uh, move resources over here rather than where you are. And so, you know, you're going to suffer some. So critical elements of a market are that there be perfect information and that buyers and sellers be able to freely come and go. Well, obviously that's tough. Doctors really dominate information. That's why the movement we talked about earlier, open notes, giving patients access to that is so important. Um, but a big problem is, let's face it, when you're in an ambulance, it's not a voluntary market. You know, when you're having chest pain, it's not a voluntary market. Uh, when you're told, you know, you have cancer. Um, it's not a voluntary market. But there are elements of health that are voluntary markets. Prevention, screening, elective surgery. So there are a lot of elements in the healthcare market that we should demand. We want this to be functional. We want to know the price. We want to know the risks and benefits. We want to know all, everything um, the drug company knows. You know, if you're, if you're taking Cialis for erectile dis dysfunction, you want to know everything. Why, why wouldn't you want to know everything? We're not talking about anything life-threatening. That's voluntary. 
So the question is how to get there, you know? Well, does consumerism work? Does, you know, really the patient-centered movement, has it changed anything? Is, is, do third parties work? It, I'm actually kind of embarrassed to say, because now it's laughable, there was a period of time in my life when I thought insurance companies were supposed to be third parties that helped me. Even they now say, no, 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 we don't do that. Now, markets aren't bad, and this is an important distinction. I mean, our system is outperforming the rest of the world in a variety of different ways. Some would argue, well, that just means we're just sucking up resources from the rest of the world. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, it is performing well. This is the distinction that, that doctors need to make. You're not interested in what's good for industry that helps industry in the market. You're interested in the market being better. You know? And oftentimes, the best way to do that is actually to even things up. You know, markets don't perform well when the buyers are overly disadvantaged to the sellers. You know, then you get monopolies, then you get all kinds of bad things. Um, don't let, you know, folks confuse you that, well, we need to do this for the drug companies. That'll help the market. No, it won't. It'll help the drug companies. You know? Um, so that's, that's an important um, distinction. And, and, you know, uh, Choosing Wisely, the campaign, and I, I'm going to mention it in a few minutes, uh, that, I, that I mentioned earlier. Doctors themselves identifying now 300 services and products that are being overused. The doctors are telling the buyer, oh, be wary here. You may not need that, you know. I don't know how many times I bought cars just, and, you know, when the salesman said, oh, now you want to put the under seal on underneath, you know, protects your car, you know, that's all bull. That, that, that doesn't work at all. Um, but they, nobody was there to tell me that. You know, that was an overused, unnecessary service. The doctors, now in Choosing Wisely, are telling patients, be wary of this. You may not need it. A lot of you don't need it. That's big. That's, that's a market tool. That's the doctor saying, we're going to wade in on your side. We're going to even things up. Who else is going to do that? I mean, every survey Consumer Reports have ever done shows the most trusted folks in the United States are doctors, nurses, pharmacists. Consumer Reports actually is pretty close, but the doctors trump us. When we say EKG, screening EKGs are overused, overwhelmingly what focus groups of consumers say was, well, okay, your consumer reports, you know, I usually believe you, but my doctor knows more about EKGs than you. I'm going to ask my doctor about EKGs. Now, while the, you know, single-payer folks fight away, uh, and I, I, again, I hope they win, you know, I just hope some of us are still left. Uh, because in my mind, what's going on is uh, on your left. I mean, we are asking consumers to navigate a healthcare market that is filled with giant sharks that just are swallowing them whole. You know? And, I mean, if you look at the data, 200,000 people, at least 200,000 people a year dying of errors in the healthcare system. Okay? Our lives and our fortunes are at stake here. We've got to build shark cages uh, until we can figure out some system thing to get the, uh, uh, the sharks down to you know, not being uh, man-eaters. So this is the market, really, isn't it? Um, you know, I like the line, if I don't think it's going to work, will it still work? But what I actually like is the picture. Because, you know, there's the doctor, white coat, erect. Look who's got all the information. Patients in the inferior position. You know, now that I'm 64, I've, I've been sitting there with that gown on. 
I mean, you know what you feel like? You know, it's kind of open in the back, and people are coming in and going, and, you know. You got to do things to even that up, to really become, you know, a partner. Um, now, in my mind, I think here are the steps to be successful at it. You got to be independent. I don't depend on sellers. I'm not dependent on the government because people don't trust government. I think especially many of you all are so much better at accessing data and potentially explaining it. And there's so much more data now. Um, you know, again, there's performance data on hundreds of heart surgery groups that's superb data. But I'm surprised when I travel among physicians, none of them are looking at it. I mean, I, I went to one uh, market, uh, gave a grand rounds, and when I asked, knowing that the doctors in that room were served by three heart surgery programs, one was a top performer, one was a medium performer, and one was a poor performer, and that was all public, how many of you know that? None of them. How many of you have seen that data? None of them. That's who they're referring their patients to. There are lots of interesting solutions emerging, media like Consumer Reports, ProPublica. Um, what ABIM is doing is wonderful in terms of professionalism, and uh, we'll look at that again. Some, some places, there are utility models that are trying to even things up in philanthropies like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. It's amazing how many market tools um, they've uh, generated. There's other organizations. Uh, I, I went to the uh, annual meeting of the um, Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care. They've got a major campaign going. It's around what they call 24-7. Basically what they're saying is they want every hospital in the country to give patient families access to their family member 24-7. The family member wants their family to be with them in the hospital. They should be with them. I had no idea that all across the country there are policies in hospitals that prohibit that and that nurses and doctors routinely tell families you need to leave and I think more and more families are going to say we're not leaving you know, we advise patients always have a family member with you always because uh, of the air issue and there's great advocacy you know if you want to be more of a warrior you know around safety or performance or uh, some of these other issues, um, those options are available to you, too. But independence isn't enough. You have to make a commitment to transparency. You know, so now you're independent, but are you, you know, on my level, you know, are, are, are you going to uh, work with me and... and and I'm going to really understand. Great story by Peter Bach, a wonderful oncologist at Sloan Kettering, whose wife sadly died of breast cancer. He wrote, uh, uh, The Day I Started Lying to My Wife, in the, published in the London Times Magazine. And this was a wonderful quote from his wife, who, during the evolution of all this, said to him, You know, I don't want my doctor knowing something about me that I don't. And really, the article was about Peter's struggle, because... He knew what was going to happen. He knew what she was going through, going to go through. So when, you know, as her husband, did he have a responsibility to tell her, you know, what was really going to happen? And when did her doctor have a responsibility to tell her, you know, what the future probably held for her? You know, I, I mean, I think we're in a culture where people want and expect to know more. And uh, when you hide something from them, um, you're on thin ice. Information really is power now. Uh, people need to know what's happened, how it's happened, why it's happened, and to the degree you can, you know, what could be next. So transparency. You know, we, we see a lot of this, so we all agree that this action is unethical. Is that a problem for anyone? You know, it gets at we know that probably a third of physicians are aware of care that's being provided by colleagues that's dangerous, wrong, 
and yet they're not doing anything about it. You know, um, especially now that we know which doctors are getting money from industry, which at least a lot of us think is unethical. Um, are we going to do anything about it? It's tough. Third is, you know, be accountable. Again, you're playing such an important role. You're independent, you're transparent, you're doing everything. I mean, a consumer reports, you know, we name names. We compare folks. And we're here to have people scream and yell at us, and they do. And we do make mistakes. And when we make a mistake, um, we correct it. Um, we're not just talking about clinical outcomes, you know. You, you need to accept you're going to be evaluated in a world where um, the experience people have uh, with your care is, is going to be out on the web. It already is. Eventually, you know, how much it costs for your care versus somebody else's is going to be out there. Um, and even that's not going to be enough because what I'm arguing is that if you really want to make a difference, you have to be collectively accountable for this being a functional market. And when you see that the market is not being fair, you know, you need to do something. You need to say something. This is not right. Um, uh, just saying it may be enough. I, I, I can't tell you how many committees, how many governance groups um, I see doctors contributing because they're the folks who listen, listen, and they raise their hand and say, well, but wait a minute, now, this isn't right. You know, we know there's an element here that's wrong. You know, a, a funny story, one of my journalist colleagues uh, was interviewing a um, um, hospital administrator. Uh, and he said, oh yeah, you work with that Santa guy. He said, I, I saw that Santa guy on a TV program and he was saying uh, uh, how unsafe hospitals were. Uh, and that all we really care about is money. And it really made me mad. And, you know, I was mad. I, I, I go to an all-day meeting of other hospital administrators all-day retreat. And at noon, I realized all we've talked about is money. And I look at the agenda for the afternoon, all we're talking about is money. And I said to them, we got to stop. Because I look at today's agenda, and what this Santa guy is saying is true. Can we figure out one topic that has to do with quality to talk about before the end of the day. And of course, I think you should be individually accountable you know, for being independent and transparent. If you take money uh, from drug companies, you better be willing to pay the price. Um, if, if you defraud uh, Medicare, you better be willing to pay the price. Um, so, so this is really a different world, and, and you know, what is advantageous is, uh, you know, um, I think this is going to happen, and so the opportunity is to embrace it. You know, we need great players. We need lots of doctors who will just see, you know, 30 patients a day, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but they need to work together. They need to both lead and follow. And that, this gets to, you know, an element I want to emphasize. That means they need to find leaders who can both collaborate and confront. Um, and you need to develop those skills. I mean, collaboration seems easier, um, but actually it can be a challenge because people will try to take advantage of that collaboration. It does mean accepting other ideas, trying them out. I mean, I'm amazed in my career how many times a, a suggestion's been made by somebody and I say, I don't believe in that. That's not going to work. But we try it, and it does work. It means sharing power, sharing leadership, sharing authority. You know, and, and many physicians have been reluctant to do that. Um, it is a chance to do good, but again, it's trickier because in most collaborations, ultimately, at some point, you're going to be listening, 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 going, now, now wait a minute. <laughs> let's, let's draw some boundaries here. Um, people are going to test boundaries. Some of them are going to do that actively. Some of them are going to do that passively. 
good teams and leaders are able to confront each other and other team members. At NPA's conference, which actually was at Consumer Reports in late October, one of the finest moments was when we had an investigative reporter talking about measuring physician performance, measuring surgeon performance. And we had a surgeon who stood up and said, I got a problem with that. You know, what I do takes, I'll use her term, a lot of cojones, and it does. And it really bothers me that, you know, I'm being measured. And, you know, they went back and forth, and you can tell the room, you know, was nervous, was tense. That's not bad. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Because we've got to figure this out. Because, I mean, if you all knew the difference it would make if we all got a service from the highest performing doctor or team of doctors, you would be stunned. It's much more powerful than any drug, okay, than any drug. And you would be stunned to find out who's not performing well. Yeah. It's tricky. This is going to make some people un uncomfortable. You have to get good at that. That tension sharpens us. I mean, really the key thing is how many of you are willing to go to a colleague and say, let's sit down, let's look at each other here. You know, I remember... When I worked for Blue Cross, I would get reports of doctors who were prescribing for themselves. And for the most part, that didn't bother me. I basically told staff, I want to know if they're prescribing dangerous drugs um, uh, and narcotics. And so here comes a report, and a guy I know is prescribing narcotics for himself. And, you know, I call him up and basically say, um, uh, you know, you can't keep doing this. And I'm, I'm telling you, you need to stop. Uh, and if you don't stop, I'm going to report you to the Board of Medical Examiners. Um, and, he, you know, he started calling me every name in the book. And, you know, my parting comment to him was, I've said what I've said. You know, it's ironic that, you know, the medical director of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon is having to do this, but I will do it. You know, six months later, he calls me, and he's kind of crying. And he says, you know, I just want to let you know that I was way out of bounds. You know, I've been through two treatment. You know, I'm an addict. I should have never done that. You know, your call tipped me over. Um, I, mean, I mean, that's way better than it usually is. But, but you've got to become good at confronting doctors, you know, at, 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 at talking right to them. I mean, you've got to push and pull people. It's really are the same techniques that we learn with patients. You're pushing and pulling. So you do that with your team. Um, I mean, for you all, I, I know some of you may just have as a priority, I'm, I'm going to be a good one-on-one -on -one doctor. And, and, you know, you need to do that. You need to learn how to do that. Don't get me wrong. But it's those of you who will say, I want more, and I can do more, and I'm willing to take more risks. You're going to make an incredible difference. And you are going to be very valuable um, uh, because this can't change um, without doctors. Y you're not going to get elected to much of anything. You're not going to be popular. You're probably not going to get much in the way of any rewards. I kind of like these two statements. Golda Meir, you know, former prime minister of Israel, you know, would say to people, don't be humble, you're not that great. And let's face it, for most doctors, even some of the saints, as, as humble as they may be, you know, we haven't gotten it done. We haven't gotten it done for you. Um, and, and, you know, I love saintly doctors, um, but oftentimes they're not tough. So as Casey Stengel, manager of the Yankees, said, look at him, he don't smoke, he don't drink, he don't chase women, and he don't win. So your job is to win. Your job is to win for consumers. Um, that's um, what's going to count. When you look at a lot of the things going on, choosing wisely, overuse, open notes, access to notes, colleagues were the major obstacle. Were the major obstacle. Were why it's not getting done. Um, we're oftentimes described as hunched over, overwhelmed with our work, burned out. Well, you know, again, I think of my two sons. They should be overwhelmed and burned out. You know, 
I know we've got tough stuff. You've got loans to pay back. But, you know, we're special people. Um, and we've got an opportunity to do special things. We've got to change that culture. Because, you know, nothing's going to work till we change that culture. I mean, choosing wisely is changing the culture around the open notes, around overuse. Open notes changing the culture around access to medical records. NPA changing the culture um, around uh, financial relationships. You know, again, just a final word. I mean, choosing wisely is probably the most successful healthcare campaign in the last two years. Mil hundreds of millions of people are getting information about choosing wisely. Tens of thousands of doctors are distributing it, uh, it now. You know, um, it's really had incredible implications because it really tries to emphasize we have to step up to being professional. But that's work. That's hard. That means you take on tough stuff. But there's good news. ABIMF recently surveyed physicians, and, and look at the results. 72% of doctors um, acknowledge that at least once a week they overuse something. 73% say it's a somewhat or very serious. 66% feel responsibility for avoiding overuse. Well, what's the important number there? 34% don't. 34, there's going to be a big problem until those stragglers accept, you know, until leaders like you figure out how to sit down with them and say, uh, uh you know, you, you, this person didn't need this stent. Again, the good news, the majority say the doctors should address this problem. And that's what we feel. Doctors, we need your help. This is where we should be. We're not there. But we're closer than you might think. And, you know, I, I, I'm really... Um, optimistic that uh, I see, you know, the turnout today. Folks like you can do this, and it will make you very happy. You know, um, uh, it will be wonderful for you to see. Um, you know, just my parting comment: what what you do need to know is, you have to adapt. Always learning. When you're through learning, you're through. I'm here to learn. You're here to learn. You know, let's do our best to figure this out. Thank you. So um, we have, I think, uh, eight minutes or so for questions. Yeah. Uh, okay. My question is, uh, I think most of us in this room would like to think that we would like to keep up in this sort of rural scenario where we think that something needs to be done right, or we think there's like, you know, a way to get the trust of the company or something like that. But a student here, sometimes in like a formal employed position, these are people that we would just like to look up to or are grading us, and that behavior might sometimes come off as like, Yeah, I agree. And I think oftentimes you all are especially in relationships where the power relationship uh, is uh, too great for a direct action, if you will. Uh, but that's not to say there aren't indirect actions that you could do, depending on, on uh, the topic. I mean, when it comes to industry influence, uh, it's pushing that AMSA scorecard Forward. I mean, if your institution's a B, they should be an A. If this is a C, they should be a B. Um, uh, waiting at the right moment um, uh, when you, you might say, you know, well, gee, uh, I see we're an A, but I was looking on the uh, CMS website or Dollars for Doctors, and it's like we have 100 doctors who are actually getting money. Um, another very interesting thing you could do um, along that line that uh, is a favorite of mine I mean, let me ask those of you who are in medical school, um, how often do your lecturers disclose industry relationships before their lectures? Hardly ever, I bet. Hardly ever. You know, one thing you could do is, before every lecture, we want to know if the person talking to us has money. You know, just make it easy for us, because we're going to go to the CMS site, the dollars for doctors. 
So, you know, be smart, be tricky. You know, I've always said you can cause a revolution from the library committee, you know. Um, you just have to keep thinking, keep waiting. Oftentimes in, in an interaction, there will be a moment when you'll feel, I think everybody is feeling um, tense about this. Um, and you say something. It may be the safest way you can, but you say something, and then, whoom, you know, it all unfolds. It's tough. John, don't these things work better in groups? Isn't that sort of like an amp, if AMSA gets together on a campus that teaches it? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, you're, you're, you're likely going to be more successful safety in numbers. Um, you're also likely going to be more uh, successful if you go to, there's usually a subset of physicians in every institution who are change agents and, um, you know, will do something and will help you do something. And you should take advantage of that. Um, uh, you know, I would say I taught for 10 years in the 90s and we, we had a special section for medical students on errors. And it was very difficult because they would see errors occur. Sometimes that would be acknowledged. Um, there's just a report from ProPublica. Um, now, it's not a randomized sample. It's, it comes from people who self-report that they've had serious errors occur to them in the system. Um, only 9% of them um, report that there was an apology. Only 11% report that somebody told them there was an error. In 30% of the cases, they were actually charged for the services that were involved in the error. Um, so, you know, we have still a long ways to go. Yeah, was there that? Yeah, what role do you think pushing transparency of, of provider reimbursement has in, in building, you know, kind of that functionally competitive market in which consumers can actually trust providers and trust that services that they're paying for are, are actually, you know, on the same scale as, as a service that they might pay someone else? Right. Um, well, you, you know, I think in the past you could argue that it was optional because you had really close to first dollar coverage, um, except for people who weren't covered at all, and, and they were definitely under those kinds of circumstances. Um, but now, you know, I think what you're going to be seeing is the good news is we have an enormous number of people, 15 to 20 million, who have coverage that didn't. But realize that coverage has some substantial deductibles, co-payments, out-of-pockets. You know, the, uh, uh, most of these folks are now covered with $1,000 to $5,000 deductibles, with out-of-pockets in the six to higher range. Uh, for a person who's got an average income, which, you know, the average income in the country is still $34,000. For a single person, they're like my son. I mean, something that costs hundreds of dollars is a disaster to them. Um, so I think they have to know it now. I mean, the other element you need to be aware of, if, if you haven't gone to healthcarebluebook.com, healthcarebluebook.com um, uh, uh, has what they call the fair price um, by zip code for hundreds of procedures and services. And, and, and so it's pretty easy to use. That's based on a database of negotiated prices. Negotiated prices, all right? So that's not, you know, what the doctor or hospital charges. It's what they actually accept. Um, they don't say that there, but the, the guy who runs it, it's a wonderful guy. We've worked with him at Consumer Reports. What you need to know is in every market, in every market, for every service, the variation in price is five times. So if you turn left at the, opera, uh, at the elevator you may pay uh, $15 for a blood count. If you turn right, you may pay 75. And there's just too much at play. I mean, you really are talking about um, destroying someone's fortune, their retirement, their, you know, everything in one fell swoop. So I think it's gonna come, and I, I hope doctors um, help with it, because uh, it's just not fair. Any other questions, comments? Well, one more, and then I think we'll, we'll be finished. Yeah. 
Well, I don't know whether his doctor has financial relationships, so it could be. Um, in his case, other medicines had been tried that were generic and cheaper, and now they were trying something newer that, you know, there was a suggestion that uh, um, uh, it might help. Um, and all of that was fine. I think he just deserved to have a heads up that when you go to your pharmacy, this is going to cost $400. I mean, by the way, you know, Consumer Reports has done a lot of work surveying pharmacies, and it's not uncommon for a drug that could cost $50 at Costco to cost, uh, you know, $400 somewhere else. And, uh, you know, that's a challenge. NPA and others are trying to work on how to get uh, information about drugs and their price and their variation and, you know, the evidence around them more easily to you in a way that's more independent and, and credible uh, than the sources you have now. Um, okay? Thank you very much.